to Riverdale After Dark, a podcast about the CW's Riverdale that's taped mostly after dark, but sometimes during the day. I'm Alex. When you spend so much time in the darkness and then record during the day, it's like, whoa, it's so bright. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And we are coming to you once again with another special interview with a behind-the-scenes celebrity from the world of Riverdale. He's been a co-executive producer and director on the show, as well as wearing many other hats that I think we'll talk about during the course of the podcast. Gabriel Correa, hello, how are you? Welcome, welcome. Did I I mess it up terribly? (laughs) No, no. You, Let's not great. dwell yeah. on it, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Let's just embrace our differences. Exactly. Oh, oh, that's nice. That's nice. fair enough. Uh, Gabriel, so nice to talk to you. We've been a big fan of your work and talked about your episodes a lot on the podcast. But I did want to take it way, way back to the beginning. Just <laughs> basic setup for people. We've done some production stuff, particularly Justin, who's worked out as a producer on a couple of shows. But for our listening audience who might just not know... You worked up from an AD to the first mm-hmm. AD to directing episodes of Riverdale, among other things. What what do you actually do? What do you do as an AD? What's the process actually like, say, and I know no episode is typical, but when you're tackling <laughs> an episode of Riverdale, what generally speaking is it like? First off, thank you guys for having me here. Shout out to the fans that make this show uh, very special and, and unique. Always a pleasure to be talking to people who appreciate our work and the the passion, the effort, the proverbial sweat, blood and tears that we put into making film and television. Yes, I started on Riverdale as a first AD, first assistant director. And... Just very quickly, prior to that, in my journey, I did 11 seasons of another very successful CW show, Supernatural, where I started as a trainee assistant director, and then from trainee to third assistant director to second assistant director to first assistant director. So that was a big journey over 11 years that led me to Riverdale as their first assistant director. Okay, what does that first AD do? Well, the first AD... And especially on Riverdale, we'll get a script, oftentimes late. <laughs> <laughs> and that is not a criticism of anybody. You know, the, these shows, you have to understand this. These shows are very ambitious. They're competing for their place, you know, in the sun. So the writers are there scrambling to put out what they think is the best version of an episode. And that leads sometimes to them being behind because they're tweaking. They're just really trying to to present us with the best possible version of that script. So oftentimes as the first AD, you get that script a lot of the times late, especially on the earlier seasons. I was in there season one, but like, let's say season two, it felt in many ways, like it was the first season because the show went up on the, on the episode order from 13 to 22. And it became this sort of overnight sensation if you will, because of Netflix, the Netflix drop. Yeah. So, you know, we, we had something to prove. The writers had something to prove. Roberto had something to prove that it wasn't just a fact. It was here to stay and they could deliver 22 episodes and really solidify themselves as, you know, a, a hit show. So you get these scripts. They're gigantic. You're the first AD. You read them and then you start a process of breaking them down. So usually you would separate the scenes you would then count, uh, do a page count of each scene. What are the elements of, on each scene? So you get a little highlight. This is before, you know, now I do it all, or, or an AD or director can do all that on a tablet or computer. But, you know, you get your highlighter, you're highlighting, you know, who are the characters in the scene? What are the elements? Oh, blood. Okay, this is special effects or, or whatever is pertinent. And once that script is broken down, you take all that information What's in special effects? What's the visual effects? What's the location? Uh, what actors are in the scene? How long is the scene? 
put that all in your computer, and then you create this funny looking strips. And with that, you start putting together a schedule for the episode, which is a fucking nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the first step on the journey, on the life of a first AD on episodic television. You get a script, you break it down, you input the information on the computer, and you start to move strips around to fit into you know, eight days or nine days, whatever the the pattern of the schedule of of that show might be. So that's really hard. That's really fucking hard. As a director who spent so much time as a first AD, oh, you're always on schedule then, right? (laughs) When I I direct, I'm always on schedule, right? I'm I'm on schedule. But the, the more serious question is that jump from first AD to director, especially within a show, I feel like that's a hard leap. Can you talk about sort of making that move? Yeah, it's it's a very hard leap because as a first AD, you do you sort of do this process that I described. You take that process and then and then you guide all the meetings, all based on what these all these departments need to do to come together to make the show run smoothly and you're supporting the director. So you're very in tune with all the elements. You're very in tune with the script and all the participants, the cast, the producers, the crew, your guest director. But for the most part, it can be a very it can be a very non-creative job, very logistical. And I think that's part of the biggest leap from first AD to directing is that yes, as a director, there was a first AD. You know what it takes to be on schedule. You know all these elements. Nothing is foreign to you. Talking to these people is not foreign to you. The scope is not foreign to you. But now as opposed to putting together someone else's right. vision, now it's like they look at you and say, okay, where do you want the camera? Where should the actors go? Do you want, <laughs> do you want the black uh, cape or do you want the red cape? You know, you are the one that have to answer all the questions. And that's where that transition becomes difficult for, for some people. You know, I was fortunate that that transition worked out really well for me. I always wanted to be a director and a filmmaker. So I was really looking forward and preparing myself for that moment. But that is probably the biggest challenge is like switching your brain from because what they use this term right for when you're an AD that becomes a director, which is don't shoot the schedule, meaning it's not just about delivering the episode on time and on budget. Think of when you have to sacrifice or even fall behind or put everything on the line because what you're capturing on the camera is not good enough or, or you have to switch gears. So that is the, probably the biggest thing. Don't shoot the schedule yet. Yeah. So it's like, don't shoot the schedule, but yet yeah. don't fuck it up. Don't be yeah. don't <laughs> behind no. that, yeah. that you can't catch up, right? You can't just make your day. You have to make your show. You have to make, you have to make the show. You have to make, and this is the thing. We're guest directors on TV. So it's about being invited back. Mm-hmm. And, you, you, and if I say, oh, I deliver everything on time, you guys. It's on schedule. It's not a penny over budget. But that show doesn't resonate with the producers, the network, the studio. Well, I'm not even getting invited back. And then the same token, if it looks amazing, but I went three days over budget, I imploded, you know, and it was a nightmare working with me. Well, guess what? I'm not invited back. So it's that sweet spot. You know, is that sweet spot of like making sure that you're efficient, as efficient as you were as a first AD, yet super creative and making sure that you don't forget that you're now are in charge creatively of that one episode. Now, I would assume like a, a night day's job is hard, but then it's got to be extra hard because that script you get is not a normal script. There's floating babies. There's bear fights. <laughs> is it extra crazy working on Riverdale because of everything that they, they kind of tackle? It's a bit, it's a bit extra crazy. It's extra crazy. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. It, it, it's extra crazy too, because let's say if I was make a comparison to supernatural, supernatural, we have crazy things in their script. But they usually are crazy things of the same vein over and over again. But Riverdale is it's, it's very it's extra crazy because it switched gears all the time. Yeah. So it would dabble on the supernatural. So all of a sudden we have to do the, the effects, the occult, the occult, whatever it is. But then on the very next episode, or sometimes I'm sorry, on the very next page, yeah, you would have a musical number. <laughs> and then you flip the page and there's a football game. So all of a sudden you have to put together a little sports action sequence 
And at the same time, you have to have the sensibility to do a cabaret musical performance. And then you turn the page, you have to have the sensibility to shoot a breakup scene and so on and so on all the time. And so that makes it really hard. The other thing that makes it really fucking hard is because there's so many of these scenes. Riverdale is a fast paced oh, show, yeah, right? It is. Like things come at you, like Ooh. you breathe. It's like, oh my God, I can, was this, was this a season? No, that was an act. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. But Roberto and, and the studio and the network, rightfully so, they demand a really high level of execution for these scenes. So even though they're very short, like your football scene may be like th literally 30 seconds long. It has to be executed as beautifully as another show that would have the same sequence, but it would be like a five minute sequence, which means they spend three days shooting it. You spending two hours shooting, but that snippet needs to be as good as your competition. That's part of all the mastery of like being able to switch gears, think really fast and making sure that everything looks amazing. I mean, Riverdale, I think, is it, it's really insane when you think of the quality of the product that everybody puts out. With the time and resources that we have, it's actually it's incredible. It's incredible. A hundred percent. And that, talking about pace, because that was my question, like there's so much happening every episode when you're shooting are you shooting for the edit constantly? Are you doing like uh, a, a, okay, um, let's do the scene. Okay. Now you need to do that same scene in half the time. Is it almost like that sort of exercise of like, let's do a fast one and an even faster one. I did that a lot. Not, not necessarily, not necessarily the way you're describing it, but, but yes, especially for me, because I think for the guest director, meaning the person that comes in, and he or she would direct a scene. They do their cut, the director's cut. They deliver that cut. They, now they're moving on to a different show, right? Right. And then Riverdale airs at 42 minutes. But sometimes the director's cut will have 60 minutes. Mm. Mm -hmm. Too long. Very long. So then, <laughs> then Roberta will come in and then he starts taking time out, you know, because he needs to deliver his time. Yeah. And he knows what's important to, to him. He knows, you know, the an overall arc. He can see the show in a way that nobody can, right? And so you start taking stuff out or or either remove scenes altogether, which is a little more rare, but sometimes they'll go, or lift a little dialogue bits or just tighten up the pace to, to the max. And then sometimes the director that did that episode doesn't even get to watch. They're so busy. Yeah that sometimes they don't even get to watch their final product. Not because they don't want to, just because they might be like two or three shows ahead already. Cause that's the life of a guest director. You got to keep working. Yeah. When I was there directing all the time, taking on that role of being a, a creative producer while well, I'm watching everybody's cut and I'm watching the editor's cut and I'm seeing how that's evolving to a director's cut. And then I'm always watching what Roberto's doing with the cut. So then it became a thing when I'm directing, I'm doing exactly what describes like, well, I have a pretty good sense of what may or may not make or, or, or how tight the space needs to be. So it's not like I would do, you don't have time to do a scene and then say, let's do the fast version of that. But I'll be constantly thinking about the cut in my head and thinking, oh, this camera move is too fast. Sorry, it's too slow. Or this and the other, because it's about fighting for everything that is good to stay in the in the episode. So if I have a great idea and it looks beautiful, but it's taking too long, I'm like, fuck, that's not going to make it. Yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to make it, you know? Yeah. So yes, you're constantly aware of the pace just because you're used to the show and you want every good bit. You, you want to give a fighting chance to every good bit to stay, you know? So it's, it's a big part of it for sure. This is, I, I do want to get back to the production for a second. I'm yeah. guessing this is not your department, but I'm just curious because fans ask all the time about deleted scenes, and that's what we're talking mm -hmm. about right now. Mm -hmm. They release them for, I think, the first two seasons, and then they switch to sort of printing the DVDs on demand, which is when I think the deleted scenes and gag reel went away. Do they still exist somewhere, though? Is there like a vault of... Uh, Riverdale deleted scenes that you're trying to crack the vault. I'm, I'm not going to say I'm going to break it, but I am planning a heist. So, <laughs> not, not that I'm aware of. I don't. I don't know. I I personally have never seen a reel put together of deleted scenes or, or anything like that. And I and I don't think there is a secret vault of those scenes. You know, 
of course, I'm sure the studio, if they really wanted to go back and, you know, you would have the director's cut of every show present, you know, that's sort of super long. But sometimes that cut, even though it may be complete in the sense that it has all the scenes, it may not be a good indicative of what Riverdale is because, as I mentioned, even the best directors sometimes, because they're not as in tune with the show as with the showrunner, sometimes little changes will be made. They will just make that episode a true Riverdale episode. So if you go back to the previous cut, yes, you'll find all the scenes, but is it going to be as good as the cut you watched plus the scenes? Maybe at times, but not necessarily all the time, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I did want to mention just for fans who may or may not know, uh, and we probably should have established this at the beginning, but you've directed, I think, about 19 episodes of the show, and I was jotting down some of them to the points we're talking about in terms of wild swings. You directed Fire in the Sky, which is the one that introduced the maple alien, had a dance battle with Cheryl and a teen, and then jumped yep. over to Jughead being kidnapped by aliens. Yeah, well, done. Pin, well pin, done. Great. <laughs> Pincushion Man, one of my favorites. Yeah. Recent, oh, yeah. That started with a first awkward jab at the kiss and ended with a wedding between Chick and Charles and Knife Point, <laughs> and then a whole knife fight. Naturally. Uh, and then, of course, the one that we should probably talk about here a little bit is Night of the Comet, which is the season yeah. six yes. finale, which hits all of those things you're talking about. Like, beyond yeah. bonkers special effects sequences you have a yeah. riot fight going on in the casino and it ends phoenix rising phoenix <laughs> rising to a rising. musical sequence which was yeah. wild like yeah particularly that moment which i remember us talking about on the podcast and i think we all went through very similar feelings of they can't possibly be doing a musical number right now and then <laughs> loving it because and it, it just it felt like at this point where else you can you go yeah uh, what was it like directing that in particular, that montage? That montage, I, I mean, by the way, I think the montage turned out spectacular. I thought it was very uh, moving. Yeah. Uh, great, yeah. great song choice. And I think also the arrangement they did in, in, you know, I call them the kids. They're not kids, obviously, but, you know, they're <laughs> in my heart. You know, they played kids. You know, I think they killed, absolutely killed it. The thing about that sequence, it's, um, you know, I read the script and things start coming to my to my mind as far as, you know, the visuals and I jolted on some stuff. And then we had a concept meeting and Roberta and I started talking about what that would be tonally, right? Because there's there's about two ways that that could go. It could be this very subdued, very somber end of the world, but it could be this apocalyptic, like things exploding, earth shaking, like, you know, everybody's dying sort of feel like a, you know, like a disaster movie type end of the world. And Roberta's like, I think we should do the more like more emotional bit and i like i'm with you i love it let's do it and then we start evolving into the song what was the song how we do it and then as we're getting close to going to camera going into filming i just i did some storyboards for that sequence i wish i had them here i'll show it to you because now that the episode is aired you know even though People listening wouldn't be able to see it, unfortunately. <laughs> we could, but anyway, we could, we, we, we could, could. yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I started doing the boards, right? And I thought, like, you know what? I got I got greedy, you guys. I got greedy. I said, like, maybe I can have it all. Like, maybe it could be. <laughs> maybe we, we could lean on the emotion, you know, of all these characters, their journeys, and and whatnot. But maybe the comet is getting closer and closer, and there is a sense of you know doom. You know, maybe that maybe that never overtakes the emotion, but. And I think we did a good job of that because I think you start it like Cheryl looks absolutely stunning coming out of the diner and kicking that off. And then you're going to our couple's different stages of their relationships. Shane was writing Hewlett, DP, DP was a cinematographer on that episode. And Shane was just somebody that worked with me a lot on previous seasons. And then he left to do another show. And then he came back to the finale with me because one of our DPs uh, became unavailable. So it was great to team up with him again. And as we're doing that sequence, we talked about the look, and he had this flashlight that you would have off camera, and sometimes you just come in and do a little flare. So if you go and rewatch the, the sequence, especially like Archie and Betty in bed, you would see these little flares that would come in and flutter just on the edge of the frame and, and yeah, transition awesome. to somebody else. So there was a lot of these little creative things to enhance that. And when Cher was lifted up on the, in the air, and the comet is coming, right? We put this image shaker on the camera. So there's an in-camera effect, but just at the very end, 
where she has her hands out and the whole thing is just vibrating enough to the point that he's like the intensity is just elevated and there's a big fan on Madeline's face and of course it's raining and it's four in the morning so it, wow. it's, it's pretty brutal to shoot but I think the end result is it's unexpected because he, like you said like what a song and yet <laughs> and yet you can't help yourself by being moved like I don't want a, a song right now I want like, oh, wait a minute. I'm so moved by this song. I love this song. <laughs> and yet keeping that sort of superhero moment with Cher at the end, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I, I think you absolutely crushed it. And I love hearing those details. I do want to ask you about one specific thing here. And Justin's looking at me right now nodding yep. his head. Go ahead. You know where it's going. As everybody's with their loved ones in the sequence, mm-hmm. Tony is singing to Big Baby Anthony. She's in the yes. sex bunker with Fangs. But the way that it's edited, it goes mm-hmm. between Cheryl and Tony at the end. Yes. We took that. We. <laughs> <up. laughs> we. Are Cheryl and Tony singing to each other in that moment? Yes, for sure they are. But I think it's less into the way I took it is it's less than a direct singing to each other. But Cheryl is singing to herself in longing. Tony is singing with baby Anthony and Fangs. But I think the more the lyrics take over and you start thinking on the meaning, I think they both go to a place that they goes into a reflection of what the relationship was, the supernatural experience that they have which is very ambiguous whether or not do, do they really not remember anything. So very much if they're singing to each other, but I think it's less of like, oh, I'm singing into the wind, hoping that, you know, when you're young and you're, you know, you're yeah. romantic, I'm singing to the wind, hoping that this person on the other side of the world is thinking the same thing. I think maybe it's less that and more is like, as I'm singing those lyrics about the end of the world and what would I want to be, I think I'm overtaken by this longing for this person that I really, really love. That's how I great answer. It, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have another uh, sort of production question. I, f- I feel like we were reading at, the, especially near the end of this uh, last season, um, that there was there were multiple units shooting at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like you had like how and as the director for an episode, sort of the a big part of the job is keeping everything in your brain at once. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, how were you able to while there were simultaneous shoots happening? Mm-hmm. bring all that together and, and sort of know what was happening at the same time. Cause that seems wild to me. It's pretty wild. I mean, it's, it's not as wild as season two wild. I can <laughs> talk a little bit about that uh, later, but what happened this at the end of this season and when we were having all these multiple units is that COVID, it was still very much an issue, right? Yeah. So at any given day, you may lose a cast member or a key crew member due to COVID and they needed to isolate. So you needed to cancel either an entire day or part of a day because certain people weren't available. And then those things start piling up and accumulating. And then you got to catch up. Now, a lot of what was done as far as multiple units towards the end of this season happened with different directors. So I'll be directing the season finale while Anna Kerrigan will be directing her episode, the episode that would never end. You know, she came to Vancouver to be here for, I think, 17 days, and she was here for, I don't know, like a month and a half or something. Wow. It was, to me, it was more keeping up as a producer, you know, about, like, what's outstanding and what's not, less so than me having to bounce back and directing the multiple units. That being said, what does happen quite often is that we call these um, splinter units. So a second unit is when you have a dedicated unit shooting simultaneously with a main unit. So they're separate directors. So I'm directing a main unit day. I have my crew. I have the scenes I have to do for my episode. Uh, I'm shooting my stuff. At the same time, there's another unit, the second unit, with another director shooting their own episode with their own crew. And that's happened simultaneously. But when it gets really tough, and this happens all the time, is when we do these splinter units. A splinter unit is when I'm shooting during the day, my stuff, and there's a tiny little crew shooting at the same time, also my stuff. So I'm directing a scene while they're prepping another scene, and I yell, cut, and I run, sprint across the stage. <laughs> because they're ready That's what I was imagining. Yeah, Constantly. and then I land there. And they're like, okay, and then action, and you do a scene, and you keep going back and forth. 
But <laughs> as intense as it is, they usually they don't run the entire day. You know what I mean? They would run, they overlap maybe eight hours with your shooting day. But I'll tell you, I like them. You know, they're they're vomit inducing, you know, you <laughs> age, you see, you see, you know. If you if you put like a body cam one new and do a time lapse, you see uh, gray hair growing in right time. Yes, you need a third unit shooting your gray hair growing. Mm-hmm. I yeah. I love also the fact that you said it's not an entire day; it's just eight hours, which is <laughs> a normal <laughs> normal day. human day. It's, it's a normal, normal human entire day. day right there. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a walk in the park. It's just eight hours of like you know doing running. two things at once. <laughs> yeah. But the thing the thing about them is, as hard as they are at the, on you mentally and physically. At the same time, I like that sense of like, let's get this done. It's almost like you're quarterbacking in like a, a big game and just like just give me the ball. Let's just keep like let's just keep doing. There's yeah. very little yeah. idling time and right, you're quarterbacking for both teams in this scenario. <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to beat yourself. <laughs> yes. Pulling the bugs bunny. Uh, I did want to ask you about a couple of specific episodes, and let's start with your first episode, which was uh-huh. the 50th episode of the series, American Dreams, the FP birthday episode. What was the weight of responsibility like? Like, you're not just getting some random episode of the show, you're getting a mm-hmm. big anniversary mm-hmm. episode right there. Mm-hmm. I mean, the weight was was huge. I, I, I grew up in, in Brazil. I moved to Canada in my 20s to attend film school to to pursue a life in this industry and i think when you want something from an early age and you now have come to the other side of the globe and and you've worked started as a pa collecting garbage and parking cars and watching generators and doing everything and then you get to that moment the pressure is indescribable because for you, you have the sense, and this is not necessarily true, but the way sometimes I took it is like, this is it. This is like, your entire career is going to make or break on that first episode, which is never true, but that's sort of the pressure you put on yourself because you're, that's it. You'll be given the chance. So I think more than even the weight of like doing an important episode, there's your personal pressure. You thinking that this is your moment and you can't possibly fuck it up. You can't do it. And then... When it came about, oh, by the way, it's the 50th episode. And so we're going to make FP's 50th birthday party. Of course, that increased the pressure on the episode. Like all of a sudden, the episode, they had a different weight in terms of of its its place in the mythology. But I think that's great. I think that's welcome because I also don't think you want to get a pedestrian episode. If if, If you're guest directing and you have one episode to do, you want to make an impression and you're not going to make an impression if you get an episode that is a perfectly fine episode, but it's just a perfectly fine episode. So I think when that happens, like, okay, while well, game on, like, you know, you want something that you could act, make a mark. What made it particularly challenging is that I didn't have a script. I didn't have a script for it. <laughs> no. Oh, you should blame the AD on that one. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have a script for a few days. So I was, I was, if prep is eight days of shooting for like four days, I didn't have a wow. script. Oh, and, and that was, that was, that was pretty intense. And then I remember <clears throat> our line producer, she got off the phone with the writers and she's like, I got some information on your, on your episode. I'm like, okay, great. Do you have an outline? Do you have some, no, no, no. I have these notes. And then she had like a, like a, like a, one of these, <laughs> one of these papers. and it had like four things, you know, bullet, like handwritten bullet, point and it said fp's 50th birthday party good archie fight rpg players in the uh new el royale uh fp and and fp and jughead go on a a joy ride with the police car or whatever like four things and i'm like (laughs) great like, what do I do with this? Yeah. I, just freak out. I just freak out because now I know the episode's going to be big, yet I have zero information about it. Uh, you could this, start blowing up balloons, I guess. There, yeah. you this definitely emphasizes our theory that most of Riverdale is written through improv, and that's pretty yeah. much it. Like, instead of going on stage and being like, let's get a suggestion. Okay, Archie gets yeah. into a fight with Hiram. Now a bear. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. I think they do it. I think they do a good job. By, I'm sure, I mean, I've never been into the writer's room, but I do know that there's a part of their process that they call blue sky which is exactly what you say like 
they just throw everything at the wall. It and, feels like that's a big part of the process. <laughs> of part, and I think, and I think what they do is that they don't self edit, which makes it hard for production because then we sort of have to figure out. And then we've got to bring it back to them and say, this is sort of doable. This is not doable in this version, but we can do like, we can't do like a grizzly bear. We can do a black bear, you know? So that's what <laughs> it's also, you're not in the business of saying, no, we don't want to be saying no, that we can't do this. We can't, yeah. you know, I think as hard as it is sometimes for production, because you get the scripts, they're really ambitious. And so the process can be exhausting just because, you know, you got to keep going back and forth until you get something that's doable. The other hand of that is that you get this amazing show because I think it's hard when they're trying to be creative and if they need to self-edit from the start. I don't think you're going to have as good a show. Yeah. As hard as it is on the production side, it's also maybe part of what makes Riverdale great. Because if the writers are sitting there and every time somebody says, what about a bear? Somebody says, well, how are we going to shoot a bear? And then they can get lost into stuff that maybe they shouldn't, you know? Yeah. I think that's the beauty of it. And and it was a great episode. It turned out that I obviously I did get a script. When I did get a script, Roberto, <laughs> it was a big script. It was even bigger than than what made it to the screen. But Roberto was really supportive. He phoned me. I remember he phoned me. I was, you know, freaking out inside, but cool as a cucumber on the outside. And he said, <laughs> and he said don't worry, we're going to wrangle this script. You know, give me the week and I'm going to do a, a pass on it and you're going to have something manageable on Monday. I, I know it's crazy. I know it's crazy. And and he did it. He, he he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He he reined it in a little bit and we did it. And, and another thing about that episode was the Choney love sequence. Oh, yeah. Which... <laughs> Which I always joke, that's what sort of made my TV directorial career because there was a risky thing to do the way we shot it. I had them out, right? If, if the network or the studio had a problem, I had coverage to sort of tame that. But I knew I knew that the, the fans wanted something more, that, that pushed the envelope a bit with those two characters. I, know, uh, I knew that there was a sentiment that maybe the let's call them heterosexual couples were maybe getting more screen time as far as the making out scenes were concerned. And and by the way, it was not intention. There was no plot of like making them bigger. It's just sometimes, sometimes it truly just is the roll of the dice. Regardless, the fans were aching that because Shoney was, you know, as you, I'm sure you know, oh, yeah. those Come fans on. are Come on, crazy. Shoney. And I wanted to service that. And Madeline wanted to service that. And, and Vanessa too. So I think the three of us, kind of got together and said like this is it you guys Let's we gotta do make this, this. we gotta yeah, make this that's awesome we gotta make a meal out of this because on the page it was just like a, a, like a one-eighth of the page it was something like and the girls make out hot and heavy all over the uh the speakeasy or something like that and roberto sort of gave permission for that to be intercut with the fight like you know he's he sort of went there, and my mind was already going there when he said it. So the minute he says, "I'm glad you said this," because I was already going there. So then I fully embraced uh, that vision, and and then I came up with those little the idea of doing those little vignettes. Right? It was almost like little vignettes, and and you know, if you think of it, this is the CW for crying out loud. So it was very yeah. risky. Like if this was an HBO show, then of course there would be nothing. But for the CW, I mean, there was implicit oral sex. There was implicit lap dancing and and fetish, and you know blindfold, and and sort of nuanced things that were I think very sexy yet elegant, and they made the cut because there's no point in me to being so risky that everything goes into the, the Alex's secret. Uh, so the balls, <laughs> you know, been here for a half hour and you get us. You already get us. <laughs> you know, like that's, then what's the point of that? Like nobody can watch it. So I, no. I wanted to be hot, but I wanted people to watch it. Yeah, the girls were absolute troopers, and 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 by the way, that was my very first shooting day. So that was on the very first day that I've directed <laughs> in my life professionally. Oh, that's yeah, wild. Short films, but professionally. Wow. So when you watch that scene, you have to have a big level of trust between your actors and a director to shoot something like that, you know? And I'm very grateful for, for them, for Madeline and Vanessa for trusting in me and, and for the bond that we created over those years that started when I was an AD, like that trust isn't built, it isn't built overnight. You know, that trust was built 
before I, I even got the chance to direct is by being good at your job, but also being authentic and honest and having each other's back, catering to bullshit or, or hidden agendas. It's just being transparent and honest and, and be there for each other. So when all of a sudden you get that scene handed to you, that could be this really challenge, awkward moment where everybody's uncomfortable when it's just a pain, or it could be a joy to shoot. And that was a joy to shoot. Like we had so much fun. And I think he paid off. I remember watching that episode and being on Twitter at the same time, not participating, just checking the fans' reaction. And they were Alex. freaking out. Like they were freaking <laughs> out. And then to me, it was like, fuck yeah, we did it. You know? Like, I, want to, I, told, I told Roberto, <laughs> awesome. when I delivered the, the episode, I said, Roberto, please don't be mad at me. I have coverage if it's too much. But I, I told him, I said, my goal is for you to get a call from the CW and say, what the fuck are you guys thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to get a call. I wanted to get a call. I wanted to get a go and go, guys, you can't do this. And, you know, that means you're pushing it, right? And But evidently, every single frame of that sequence made it. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Yeah, great. That's well, memorable. Great job. Uh, I mean, not to pivot into something more serious, but there's another episode you directed pretty soon after that, which is another enormous responsibility, which mm -hmm. was In Memoriam, the episode that was paying tribute to Luke Perry yeah. while still being a Riverdale episode. And I know that that was something that wasn't just Riverdale fans. Right. I think the entire world of entertainment and fans of Luke Perry were looking at how is the show mm -hmm. going to pull this off and I think we agree it completely pulled it off, but without prodding too much, what what was the feeling like on set when you were trying to put that together? Uh, so that episode, I mean, you talk about real pressure. That was that was real pressure. Yeah, because it, it was the first episode I directed in this new role as now being a director and a, and a producer, right? So this is yet another uh, one of those amazing opportunities to show what you made up. But then your first episode is in memoriam and, and with so many layers to it. The first one obviously being Luke, the person that he was, I can't, he's just, he was exceptional. Luke was exceptional. And Luke, he would come to me when I was 18 And he would say, man, you're a director. We're going to get you one of these. Just, mm -hmm. just stay cool. Stay cool. It's not going to happen this season, but you got it. You got it. We're here for you, man. And when you do it, you're going to be great. And he was that type of guy. And he was alive, obviously, when I directed my first episode. And there was a little scene. He was only in one little scene. <clears throat> Actually, that scene was added. He wasn't even in FP's birthday party. And then, and then he got put on. He just cut, they come, they do a little moment. It's a very short scene. So I directed him for very little that episode. You, you know, maybe it was a couple of hours that he was on set. And we did it. And then he was wrapped. And he didn't go home. He stayed back there and then you just stay back there and you chat to people and then, you know, you'll be sort of like, you, you feel he's just in the background. And then before he went home, he came to me, he's like, I'm watching you, bro. I'm watching you. Got this. Just, just keep being <laughs> you. Just, just do your thing. You're doing great. You're killing it. And, and that's Luke. You know what I mean? What can you say about somebody who, you know, is there when he doesn't need to be there? to support people and he's generally like watching what's what you're doing and supporting. I think that's uh that right there tells everything you need to know about Luke. So that to me was very emotional. I knew what Luke represented as far as helping me get that opportunity. Not just Luke, all the cast, but Luke being of course a, a, a you know a big presence on that on that roster. And then I'm in prep, I'm I'm like, okay, we got this. And then Roberto sends out a tweet saying that this was the most important episode of Riverdale ever. 
<laughs> hashtag oh, no man. pressure. Hashtag no pressure. And then, and then it was like, okay, fuck my life. <laughs> like, you know, I have to honor Luke. I can't screw up everybody's expectations. You got to get totally right. Like, and it was a season opener. And then he got a. Anyway, it was just a, it was just a lot, and it was a lot for everybody because it was very real, it was very recent, it was very raw, and, and some of the scenes were really intense. You know, we had that the funeral was yeah. extremely hard to shoot. He had the site of the accident that was really hard to shoot, and then and then the kids praying together with Shannon. So it's full of these moments, and we made it through together. And as a director, it was very hard because it's not like you can push people to, to rock through these feelings. Right. It's a very delicate act. The important reality is that you have to deliver an episode of television. Well, and plus the, the, both the actors and the characters are experiencing this grief, but it's not mm-hmm. the same, you know? So, like, that's such a hard it's acting challenge. And you hard. have to, like, it's toggle very that. Hard. Yeah. And, but to me, what sort of it's one of my favorite memories of Riverdale is directing that because when people like Robin Givens, who's who's a pro and a sweetheart, and she wasn't there every day, when they would come to you and you're directing a big scene and KJ's having a super hard time because he was so close to Luke and it's the funeral, and, and you're navigating that with with finesse and sensitivity of, of the subject and what it means to everybody. When that older cast, they've seen it all. When they come to you and they're like, that's the best thing Roberto ever done, like you directing this episode. There's nobody else that should be here. You know, like we should be amongst family and, and this is it. We're, we're all glad you're here. We see how you're handling this and, and thank you. Like when they come to you with that, that to me, like fuck everything else. Like, the, like yeah. nothing else matters anymore <laughs> at that point as far as accolades. That's the accolade. When you're dealing with something that real and the people that are affected by that come to you and thank you for the way you're sort of steering that ship, that to me is like the biggest compliment you could ever have. And, you know, KJ had a, a really hard time as, like, as expected. So, so did everybody. But KJ in particular, like, you know, you have to understand these kids – became famous really quickly and they were paired up in the story with these actors who had success in, in a different era. And so they, they become these natural mentors, right? Machen to Lily to to Cole and and Luke to KJ. You know, it just happens naturally because they're in scenes together. So they pass on all the knowledge. So inevitably they, they grow very they grow very close, right? And KJ, being from New Zealand, he's very far from his family too, right? It's not like he can go to L.A. on the weekend and hang out with his family. Like, he, this is a very young kid that is now super successful on another side of the, the globe. And so Luke it became a, a father figure to him, you know? And so he's having a hard time. And, then, you know, I remember, and he was putting a lot of pressure on himself, you know? And I remember having this conversation with KJ where... He's like, man, I really don't want to be here. This, this is so hard. And I'm like, it's okay. We'll, 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 we'll do it together. We'll breathe in, in, you know. And he says, I, I feel this expectation. I feel this expectation that everybody looks at me when the camera's rolling, that I should break down uncontrollably because they know what Luke represented to me. And he's talking about us on set, the crew. Like, he's worried about right, right. I, am I grieving enough? Am I sad enough? He's putting all these questions and said, KJ, stop it. And I, and I told him, I lost my father six years ago like that in, a, in an instant heart attack, 63 years old, very, very healthy otherwise. So not that different from what was going on with the, both the character mm-hmm. and with Luke and his stroke. And I told KJ, I, I've been through this, man. And I said, no two human beings grieve the same way. You know, some people can cry and control me. Some people get really angry. Some people become quiet. And I said, I don't give a shit about what anyone wants from you. You are who you are. And I want you to be authentic. I'll take an authentic beat from you when you're there in the moment. From you trying to cry or try to do something because that's what you think people would expect from you. I am officially liberating you from that. 
you know, you're free. You're now unshackled. Be yourself, and I'm here for you. I would not let you look foolish ever. I'll protect you. Don't put that pressure on yourself. You know, human beings are different. And so we did it together, you know. So you see how many layers come into play, right, with an actor, you know, that prevents him from being in the moment, you know, a very tough moment. But I, KJ was phenomenal. And as, as hard as it was for him, he conquered it, and I'm very proud of him for doing it. That's amazing. You know, when we, that scene on the side of the road when they were praying, Yeah. after we wrapped that up, the sun was setting. We're on the field, right? And I call all. I call. I called all the crew to come to that spot. And and I and I said something about Luke. And like I believe I'm not a religious person, but I, I but I'm spiritual, but non-religious. If that's make if that makes any sense. But to me, it was like that's Luke right there. He sent us that. Like his Luke was that. Like an open field with the with the sunset. You know, it was very beautiful. Yeah. Well, it's very rare when I cry on this podcast, and I just yeah. did. So thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I mean, I know we've covered a bunch of the episodes here, and we've already sort of talked about. You've mentioned some that are your favorites, but do you have one that we haven't mentioned that particularly jumped out to you for any particular reason? I know we haven't, for example, mentioned like graduation day. You directed that as well, which was fantastic. Yes, I think graduation jumps at me for sure, and the like, paradox the one hundredth episode. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, oh, wow. graduation. I thought. I mean, I was so looking for the moment that Roberto said, "Okay, they're graduating," and that was that was meant to be our season finale. I'm like, I love it. Like, what a fun sort of end of an era. And what happened is that I was about to start prep on that episode, and we the the poll got plugged because of COVID. We, we had like a four-day shutdown because of a COVID scare. But then we never, they were never filmed again. And so that season was cut short. And what was meant to be the season finale of season four, that became, I think, the third episode of season five. If my, I, maybe I'm fucking this up, but I don't think I think that's right. Very, it was like the third episode in, but it was very much like a season finale. And it was beautiful. I loved every second of it. And there's a sequence in particular that I that I just love, and I put a lot of thought into it, and I think it paid off, is when Archie's going out of town in the bus. I think that looks phenomenal. I, it's hard for me to say, I don't like, it's not, oh my God, I'm so, like, it's not that. I, I hate commenting yeah. on myself. But <laughs> well, how about, everybody... I'll say it instead. I think that looks phenomenal. Like, there's something about that sequence where the filming, the lighting, the way mm. that it's paced out and everything, it almost yeah. feels like this dreamlike quality yeah. to it. It had a dreamlike quality, but also touched sort of the Archie history in the same way. Uh-huh. Like it just encapsulated uh-huh. so much at the same time. And and it's nice when I say I thought it was phenomenal is because it's amazing when different members of the creative team come together to do something that turns out so good. So first there was on the page, that sequence, by the way, almost got cut off because the episode was big. We're dealing with challenges in COVID and Roberto's like, okay, let's part with the bus. And we're trying to wrangle this episode. And at one point, we sort of look at each other. And we're almost at the same time. It's like, we got to bring that sequence back. Like, it's just so simple. <laughs> and, then, and then we brought it back, which I'm glad we did. So start there. And then I remember where we're just sitting, you know, and then, the jalo- and then they show up in the jalopy. And this was a concept meeting. And I think I made the stuntman sort of like, faint maybe like I threw this curveball because in my mind and I told her but I've always saw Veronica standing up I said there's no way to me that you'll be waving to Archie sitting in the car to me I said to Roberto if this feels like we're in the French Riviera in some you know 1950s movie with a scarf flowing in the wind and she's waving her lover and he says of course and then, and then it's like, oh, so we mean we have to harness her? Like, this is so, this is like, nah, it's not dangerous. We'll get, you know, and you, they figure it out. But so it started with this, this we're all in sync, right? With, with what the, the iconography is of that moment. You know, the, your lover in the wind, in a convertible car, waving you goodbye. Sort of these iconic moments in, 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 in film history. That you that you draw upon, so that was very nice. And then in editing, I remember we shot. It was a beautiful day. We shot it. We got it by the skin of our teeth because it was all daylight dependent, right? So we shot to the brink, 
uh, of daylight. Uh, that bus was a vintage bus. Of course, it broke down in the middle of, of the <laughs> shoot. And, and then it, it broke down, you guys. So it was like leaking oil. I'm like, oh, fuck my life. We're never going to make it. And all of a sudden, like, okay, we can do it. But the bus can't, can, they can't steer the bus. Because there's no uh, there's no power steering anymore. So literally the bus, thank God it was a straight road. The bus could only drive straight and then he had to back up to its number oh, one. Oh, wow. <laughs> Pain in the ass. Time consuming. Wow. So, you know, it was really hard to shoot. But then it was a beautiful day. We shot it. Uh, I storyboarded that sequence too. So it was very well planned. And then Adam, our editor, who's phenomenal. Got to be. He's so good. He's so good. Uh, and a pleasure to work with. So Adam presented me. It was this thing where it was in that season, the COVID season, the first COVID season, I was shooting back to back to back to back episodes all the time. So I would shoot an episode. The very next day I was prepping the, the, the next episode while I was editing the previous episode. So it's a, a bit crazy. So I was prepping. I can't even remember what episode I was prepping anymore. But I was prepping an episode. And Adam was editing and sending me sometimes just one sequence, you know what I mean, to work yeah. at a time. So mm -hmm. he sent me that sequence. And I got on the phone with him and I said, Adam, I don't think we got the song yet. I don't think, I don't think this is it. I don't think this is the song. I think I, and I sort of, we talked, what is the emotion we wanted to convey? And he's like, I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Give, give me a few days. And then he came back and presented the sequence with that song. And not only is it a great song for the sequence, the way that he manipulated the song and, and spliced it together, right. the way that that song works with the pe emotional peaks and valleys of the scene. And there's things like, you know, there's like a, 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 a drum beat and a high pitch the moment that Archie reaches that back window and puts his hand up, you know. So every, it's almost like the song was composed to, to the cut. And that's all Adam and editing. Oh, um, I thought for sure it was, but it was just edited, just editing. It, it was edited. I mean, of course, the, the song lends itself to these moments, but like, he also fade the song out yeah. and then splice it into a beat. So, like, he manipulated so all these things could match that's the so scene. And I think the result, you know, and that last image of, you know, the, the three friends coming to the to the road, you know, with Veronica in front and you have the Riverdale sign in the back. I mean, that's right there is an image that you never forget. Yeah. Right. I just wish, imagine if that was truly the season finale and then you and then you had to wait months to find what the fuck happened, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what it meant to be, right? It would have been yeah. even more powerful. So that yeah. obviously was a big thing. Um, and then the 100th episode, you know, I, I, told, I joked with Roberto, I said, I've never asked you anything. You know, I never said I want to direct this or that. Like, you tell me, jump, I say how high. But there's no fucking way you're going to give the hundredth episode to anybody else. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm uh, doing this motherfucker. <laughs> and it's, like, awesome. so cool. it's like, of course you're doing it. But that was great. You know, there was also a, a beautiful idea with the, uh, with the sort of universe is the metaverse. And then the, the comic books, you know, again, that's also a very, that encapsulates a lot of, of what Riverdale is about, which is this, craziness and multiverse and heroes yet this very weird and vintage iconography right it's that's the paradox of riverdale you know you are that crazy but yet you're grounded in these very iconic moments of whenever we choose a prop on riverdale it's almost like if i say we need an axe like a fireman's axe you close your eyes and think of what that is, like the archetype of an axe, you know, with a little wooden handle and maybe the, maybe the tip has a little red on the wood. That's the axe we're choosing. Whatever, whatever I say, if I say a horse, you think of that, you know what I mean? It's almost like Plato. It's like you're in the cave and you have these archetypes of what these things are. That, those are the props. Everything is like, it's the milkshake. We want the milkshake in the classic cup that everybody thinks of it, you know? Uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. L let me throw just a couple of things out there to you. As a director who's directed a lot of episodes, who do you ship? 
Ooh. Ooh, oh, okay. So now, wow. oh, guys, yeah. <laughs> you want me to get death threats? It's uh, it's what it's yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> this is the end of you, saying. Gabriel. <laughs> wow, this is the end of me. And and just to follow it up, when you're directing your favorite ship, do you give them like a little extra love, like a little extra sugar on well, there? Like I, like, sure, yeah. I mean, sparkle in the Sony, eye. It's, Sony is my it's my thing. Like I mean, yes. I will always give them yes. extra love. They know that they know that I'm all about them. I will always give them extra love. It's so hard because every of the I mean, Sony. Let's say it's it's part of my history in Riverdale. It's it's a no brainer. The other ships, each of them has these very iconic moments. I mean, you can't deny that Bughead has been this remarkable, unexpected, it's almost like the anti-hero couple. Yeah. It's the anti-hero couple, couple, right? It's what I think. When, when I was young, I probably would identify myself with Jughead versus an Archie versus like a jock or an athlete. Mm-hmm. That person rarely gets the beautiful all-American all blonde girl in a right. ponytail. So in many ways, there was a beautiful anti, anti-hero anti ship, you know, that was so iconic. I really liked that story. Yet when that was, when that was over and they evolved different things, I never longed for them to, to get back together. You know, I thought it was great for what it was and that moment of youth and that type of love. Because I also say that Jabatha, has evolved into a beautiful couple with different layers. Yeah, now we're talking about now we're talking about an adult couple, right? One which has Jughead struggling with addiction and whatnot. So now there's different layers, and I love the two of them on screen. I really love the two of them on screen, you know. And then you have Barchi, and they had some phenomenal scenes together this season. Phenomenal scenes, you know, head to head. Beautiful, and these two guys crying, and it's very genuine, very emotional. You're talking about two two characters that put a lot of pressure on themselves, right? Archie, his hero complexes, complex, trying to be the man he thinks he should be because of what Fred Andrews was, and then you have Betty with the big trauma package of her family history. So these two guys. They almost, they don't forgive themselves, you know, and then now they're together. They're both trying to sort of appreciate them for who they truly are and not trying to be someone else. And that was beautiful. And then Varchi is this raw, sexy couple that is, I think, in that sort of era, is unmatched about how, how powerful and sexy they were and how impromptu those scenes were so... So your answer is all of them. All of them. I have to answer them in a different way. But I'm going with Shoni. I'm going with Shoni. That's my final answer. And I gave a little bit of love for everybody. All right. I love it. Uh, I did want to ask you, right behind your head, there is this Archie's things that seems to be signed by a couple of people. Uh, What's going on with that? So behind me, I have this beautiful, it's like the bass drum art. Yeah, right. For the Archie's. And it's signed by everybody. So the story behind this, so this was used for the Hedwig uh, musical. Mm-hmm. Right. I think they're playing Midnight Radio oh, in the yeah. speak music, which was a beautiful musical number. That was the art on the bass drum. And I thought it was beautiful. And I'm a drummer. And so I went to Andraj, who's our incredible props master. I said, Andraj, I have a lot of shit here, you guys, by the way. Everything. That, <laughs> yeah. Like, I have. Oh, so you're you're the vault. Your house is the vault. No, <laughs> the okay, I get it. I have little uh, casino chips from, uh, oh, from the wow. Babylonium. I have, oh, I have, I have a Riverdale High School diploma with my name on it. Like I graduated. Oh, wow. oh yeah, awesome. I, I've got, I've got stuff. So That's I went amazing. to Andraj and I said, dude, I, that, I need that art, like that, that bass drum art. I want it. And then he's like, yeah, no problem, dude. He gave it to me. And then I brought it to the kids and I said, well, just sign that for me. And they did. And it's That's beautiful. Awesome. It's one of my favorite pieces that I have. And I have many things. And Roberto and I kept, there was this joke that I told him that I was going to take the jalopy when the season was over. And he said, over my dead fucking body. He said, you get to, he said, you get to keep the soggy 
uh, moldy body of Jason Blossom. And <laughs> I'll take the jalopy. Wait, do you actually have Jason Blossom's body? <laughs> I don't, but oh, I, don't, right. I don't think that I'm allowed to have it yet. The show's still going. But there was a thing. It's like, you, you, you take Jason Blossom's body, I'll take the jalopy. Yeah. Uh, but I don't have it. What I did do, you know, you know, you have the uh, the Julian doll, right? Mm-hmm. Oh my god! Which is brilliant. It looks it's incredible looking. It's very expensive. It's so it's, creepy. It's very creepy. Custom made. There's some behind the scenes where I'm I'm shooting with the doll and Madeline, and I'm doing the little doll's voice off camera. Oh we never god. made a cut to see if I can make her laugh. I just want to play with you, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> but so we had Matt, Mads and I and Tammy had this idea and I said, guys, Roberto's obsessed about the doll and he wants us to send the doll to him. And I said, we should make a Roberto doll in, <laughs> in the vein of the Julian doll. So we got this photo of him off the internet with his classic like bow tie and his glasses and took it to our props master and we had a sculpture and oh, put wow. in a suit with his initials. So we made a Roberto doll and then he was visiting, visiting the set and we put the Roberto wow. doll in the on, on his chair with a little script. <laughs> that's amazing. He, he freaked out. He loved I it. But, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, before we let you go, though, what is next for you? What projects do you have lined up, if anything, that people can check out? So, um, you know, next for me, it's a bunch of freedom and time off that I've been spending with family, which is oh, great. Congratulations. And now, nice. Yeah. It was very nice. And now moving on to new things. So, as I mentioned, I'm Brazilian, and I would love to do some projects in Brazil. I've currently, I'm currently in development with two feature films, one for Netflix ah, Brazil and one for Amazon Brazil. Ooh, cool. One, the one for Netflix is um, this very fun story of a, a scam artist. I don't know if you guys, to me... I don't know if you watched an Argentinian movie called Nine Queens. It was a very good movie, very famous. It was about these Argentinian scam artists. So to me, it's almost like if that met, it, like it's Nine Queens meets James Bond or Ocean's Eleven, so it's more elevated and it's in cool. the sort of high society, but a scam artist. And he has this actress named Larissa Manuela, who is a powerhouse and an absolute global phenomenon. She has like 50 million followers on, on Instagram and she's a superstar and she's attached to that. The Amazon feature, it's more of an international story. It's a rescue mission in Africa that's dealing with the site, a natural disaster cyclone based on a real story. So it's a bit of an action movie that involves a rescue mission, political corruption, touches a bit on, on climate change and some issues that are very important. So I got these things going on and I'm also developing a couple of TV series that I can't talk too much about it right now, but they're fun and hopefully they'll be coming to screen very soon. Awesome. Sounds like a cakewalk compared to running between splinter units. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, listen, Gabriel, we are going to miss you on this final season of Riverdale, but we have loved seeing your work and we Thank really appreciate so much, man. Uh, taking all this time to chat. The stories have been phenomenal. Good luck with everything coming down the road. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, guys. Always love chatting with you. And if you'd like to support our podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast on YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about Riverdale. Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Riverdale Dark on Twitter, Riverdale After on Instagram, Riverdale After Dark on Facebook. Until next time, we'll see you. After dark. That's when Alex asks all his Shoney questions to his <laughs> pillow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you